Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Let me thank you for being in the house of the Lord to come and to worship with this family called WBC. For those of you that are on Facebook who are joining us, let me welcome you. It's been two years since we've been in the baptismal pool. Two years. But this morning, we're back in it and we thank the Lord for that. What a precious time it is when we have a young one. Jesus says, you know what, don't hinder the children. Don't hinder the children to come to me. In fact, that was one of the biggest rebukes he ever gave his disciples. But don't, don't hinder them. Let them come to me. And let them know who I am. And this day, we have one of those children who came to him. Who trusted him as her Lord and Savior. Who wants to come, <clears throat> who wants to come this day to show you an outward expression of an inward change. You see, it's not baptism that saves you. It's not good works. It's not the money you do. The only thing that saves you is your trust in Jesus Christ and allowing Him to transform your heart. And that's what, exactly what Kendall has done. I had the privilege of talking with her several weeks ago. How excited she is. You're going to see an excited little girl, young woman. Her smile radiates from her heart because she knows what Jesus Christ has done for her. My prayer has been over these last couple weeks that God would use this time to start a revival in this church. To start a small fire for people to get just as excited as Kendall is. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Let me pray with you all. Father, Thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace. And thank you, Father, for this day. What a beautiful day it is that you've given us to come in, to worship you, to be able to start off the worship service, Lord, with a baptism, to be in obedience to your word. Father, I thank you for all of those that are here. I thank you, Father, for all of those who have influenced Kendall. I thank you, Father, for the way that they have pointed her towards you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be heavy among us during this time and as we sing and then as we hear the word. And I pray, Father, that as he is among us, may he encourage us, may he strengthen us, may he convict us of what we need to do for you and to be more in focused for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for calling Kendall. And thank you, Lord, for her excitement and her heart and for her smile. So, Father, as we go in this time of baptism, may you be glorified. May you be honored. May you be praised. And in that, Lord, we'll just bask in your glory and knowing and rejoicing that another life, another soul has come into your kingdom. And for that, we thank you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want you to look, Kendall, at everyone out there. They're all your brothers and sisters in Christ if they've trusted in Jesus. And they're all here for you. Waxhaw Baptist Church is here for you. No matter what you need, no matter what time of day it may be, you've got brothers and sisters in the faith that are here for you. Isn't that great? The Lord takes care of us, don't you? See that smile? Do you see the smile? It melts your heart. But it's because it comes from the joy inside of knowing Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Kendall, have you trusted the Lord to be your Savior? Yes. Well, then it's my privilege, my sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
buried with Christ through death, walk, raised to walk in the duties of life. should start a worship service. What a wonderful day it is to be together in God's house as brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to witness that. That is um, an ordinance of the church, but more than that, it's an act of worship. And so we are thankful to be able to celebrate today what God has done in Kendall's life and her family's life in this church's life. Um, What a wonderful day it is. So we're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're, we're so thankful to have you in in the house of the Lord with us this morning. Thank you to uh, joining us on Facebook as well. We're glad that you are here. And again, we are here this morning to worship. And what a way to start our worship. Um, and what a way, what, what a week it has been. Um, and today is a reminder of the hope that we have in Christ. The hope that uh, he has indeed taken those who were dead and raised them to life through his son. And so again, we're glad you're here. Thankful that you're here to to worship with us this morning. I do have several announcements. I'll make this brief, but uh, remember that tonight we have multiple things going on here at the church. Uh, At five o'clock, if you're a member, we have our our church conference meeting. And so we ask that uh, that you come and be a part of that. Uh, We do have several matters that need to be taken care of uh, that that we will be discussing and voting on. So if if you are a member, be here tonight at five o'clock for our church conference. And then also uh, this evening at five o'clock, we'll have our onward students meeting. That's our youth meeting. So come and be a part of that if you're in middle school and high school. Um, And also um, one other announcement is remember that November 16th through the 23rd, uh, we will have our onward, our, our, excuse me, our Operation Christmas Child, um, Operation Christmas Child Collection Week. So if you are looking for a way to volunteer, uh, this is an, an excellent opportunity. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, for your, or you can uh, contact Joan Fox for more information about helping out with this. There are also uh, extra boxes in the back that if you and your family would like to participate in this event, that you can pack a box and uh, bring, it, bring it back. So those are in the back as well. Uh, I do have uh, one thank you note that I would like to read. It says, Dear WBC family, family thank you so much for the honor to serve such a wonderful group of people. To journey this thing called life with you all is such a blessing. To watch as God continues to glorify his name through WBC is a joy. I wanted to thank you for the gift given to Jake and myself for pastor appreciation. Your kindness is very much appreciated and a blessing uh, for both of us. May God bless each heart for your generosity, love in Christ, Pastor Chris and Laura. So that's from Pastor Chris and Laura. Let me read to you these verses from Proverbs 3 as we continue our worship this morning. It says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Let's let's turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful day it is. And what a great name you have. And Lord, as your people, we turn to you this morning. Father, we can all say that it has been a difficult week and trying at times. We've been up, we've been down. And Lord, we come to you this morning needing to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. That we who were dead in our trespasses and sins have been raised to life with Christ. And what better reminder than to see young Kendall taken under the waters of baptism and raised back out of them. Lord, to signify to us again that we were once dead in our sins. But through your son, Jesus, you raised us to life. 
So, Lord, we worship you and we give you thanks. We also thank you for Kendall and for her family. And, Lord, the opportunity to celebrate this public declaration of her faith. And, Lord, the joy that is in her heart and on her face, we pray that that would stay there. And, Lord, we pray that it would serve as a reminder to us of the joy that is found in Christ. And, Lord, we pray that this church, the responsibility we would have in continuing to help her grow in her faith, to walking alongside of her, because we know there will be days that are up and down. Lord, we pray that she will cling fast to you, continue to grow in her walk with Christ. Lord, we pray that together we would serve you and Lord, we thank you for bringing us here today that we can celebrate you and worship you. Lord, help us to continue to do that this morning. So we give you thanks and we give you praise. And we ask, Lord, that your will be done in our lives, in the life of this church, in the life of this nation. It's for your glory and honor that we pray these things and we pray them in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. But all stand with me, join with me, sing when the roll is called up yonder. Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. Let me ask you all something. Are you all right today? Are you here? You woke up? Everything's still all right? 
Good. Because you know what? I have been tired of this election process for the last how many ever months it's been. Tired of it. You know what? If, if everything holds true, what's happening, it's all right. God is still on the throne. You see, we don't follow man. God is still on the throne. And because God is still on the throne, it means that we can still be salt and light. Anything that's happened, folks, is not a surprise. It first started with the first king of Israel. Israel elected a person. He was King Saul. They rejected God. God gave him a, gave him a king. Right? Guess what happened? Then there were good kings and there were bad kings. Good kings and bad kings. Good kings and bad kings. Same way with us, folks. It's nothing that we don't already know. It's nothing that God has not already told us. It's be all right. Persecution comes. Oppression comes. We know what the Word of God says. Right? We're still supposed to be the salt and the light. There's nothing to fear. It's all right. All through the Bible, what did Jesus say? Jesus didn't come and make a Christian government. Jesus came and he changed individual lives and the community around him as the church should be doing. Jesus told Peter what? Peter, pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God. It's all right, folks. It's all right. It'll be all right. It always has been. Just remember, the last time I looked, Jesus Christ is on his throne. And I don't think there's anybody that can knock him off of that. There's a question which many of us answer throughout life. Are we able to do some sort of job, the physical requirements? Are we able to buy something financially? Are we able to stand up to persecution for something that is right? We answer many of that, right, throughout our lives. On the flip side of this question is another thought. Are you able involves the question if you can do something. Are you able to do this? Actually, the question is, can you do it? The other, being able involves the power to do something. Do you have the power? to do it there's a big difference between the two the first question involves uncertainty the second question or the second answer involves certainty as human beings the first question is something that we have to ask Jesus is the Lord the Lord and the King of Kings he's certain he can do it I'm certain that he can do it. He's able to do it. There's only one who is truly capable of being able to do all things. Only one who is able to strengthen, give courage, boldness, knowledge, wisdom. Only one who can give perseverance, assurance, and salvation. And it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is not president. It is not vice president. It is not senate. It is not your spouse. It is not your friend. It is Jesus Christ who reigns on the throne. That's who it is. So let me ask you again this morning. Are you all right this morning? Is there fear in your heart? Hope not. I hope not. This morning as we roll into Thanksgiving, we're starting a new series called Thank You, Jesus. This message is entitled For Being Able, and we're going to be in Jude Verses 24 and 25 this morning. Jude is located right before the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Let's look what it says. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, 
To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, author authority before all time, now, and forever. So it be. Amen. That's what it means. So it be. The letter of Jude is an Instagram or a text to the church. It's a short letter. It's a powerful little text, which is an exhortation of the church of Jesus Christ to what? To wake up, church. It's time to wake up, is what Jude is saying. Quit following what the culture says. Quit listening to what the culture says. And to wake up and put your focus back on Jesus Christ. Jude's the half-brother of Jesus. He was a skeptic. He was a skeptic of his brother until he weighed the evidence. And if you look in the Bible, you can see some of that evidence. I'll let you read that for yourself. But he was a skeptic, and he didn't think Jesus was who he claimed to be until he saw him after the resurrection. And we see here that Jude wrote this little Instagram. Jude was writing to the church about the common salvation they had together. Look in verse 3. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. He only made it through the first part of the sentence when the Holy Spirit changed his direction. The Spirit set upon Jude's heart and conscience to write, to contend for the faith. What does that mean? It means to fight earnestly, zealously for, defend, to struggle for, to make a laborious effort for the historical Christian faith. It sounds the trumpet to call into battle, folks. We are soldiers of Jesus Christ. We are called into the battle each and every day. Yet what we're going to find is this, is this passage is actually a doxology. A doxology, what is that? It's a brief formula for expressing glory to God because of his infinite nature. It's praising God because he is able. Have you praised God this morning? I hope so. I wonder how many Christians have been praising God this past week. Did you praise him yesterday when the news came out? Should have. He's worthy of it. He's the only one worthy of it. Why? Because he should be our source of hope, folks. He is the source of hope. Not our government. Not our people up there. Jesus Christ is our source of hope only I wonder how many Christians understand the Bible and understand the things that are predicted in it you see this is why I can't I've heard this now for several months I've heard people that are afraid that have no hope and everything is I don't understand it because the Bible teaches us this this very thing from Genesis all the way to Revelation Why is that? This world is whose? The devil's. The father of this world, the father of lies, is the devil's world. Why should the Christian be surprised at what's happened? Why should the Christian be surprised at all that anything like that happens when we have God's word in front of us? I can't help to ask this question. How many of you are just concerned about the church as you were the election without putting the church under the guise of the election okay how many of you are that worried how many of you would go out and campaign for the church now that all the election stuff's over with will you go out and will you campaign for the church will you campaign for Jesus Christ will you stand up for what is right even though you may be oppressed and persecuted Tough question, isn't it? What if the Christian would campaign for the church to continue the fight in our local communities for the faith? We're going to have to do that at some point in time, folks. 
unless God takes us home or comes back. Persecution, oppression is coming to America and to the church and to the Christian. It's where you and I are going to stand. Are you going to stand where the rubber meets the road and stand with Jesus just as John and Peter did in front of the Sanhedrin when he said, hey, you make the call, but you know what? We're going to obey the Lord. We're going to stand for him. Don't you talk about that. You don't talk about marriage, abortion. Don't you talk about the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. You're going to have to make a choice. Are you going to follow the culture or are you going to follow Jesus Christ and what he wants us to do? See, that's what Jude's writing about. Is the church going to continue to fight and campaign to our local communities for the faith, to spread the gospel, to fight the good fight, to stand for God and not man? Did you hear that, folks? We stand for God and not man. I just wonder if this is not a wake-up call to the church. I just wonder, you know what, there was so much confidence and all this other stuff still may be. You know what? Only God knows what's going to happen. Okay? But I wonder if this is just not the wake-up call of saying, you know what? Folks, Christians, you're putting your faith in the wrong person. You need to put your faith in me. I'm the one that's able. You see, people think that they're all powerful. That, that, that you know, we can go in and we can vote. And yeah, you know, whoever party candidate is, I don't care what it is. Oh, we got the power. No, we don't. God's got the power. He's the one that has the power. The devil even has to answer to him. Folks, don't miss out on that. It's a wake-up call to the church to see there is only one who is able. It's God Almighty through his son, Jesus Christ. I wonder how many of you truly understand that today. Truly understand it. Because when we truly understand it, we can praise God in the valleys as well as the mountaintop. We can praise God in the mundane things. That's when we understand it. So the challenge this morning. I want you to see this morning something very important to the church. I want you to see that this is not a pure milk message that Jude is writing. I want you to see he's not writing in baby language, but this is a meat and potatoes message to the church of Jesus Christ to wake up and start seeing what the enemy is doing in the church's midst. You know what? The devil's laughing, folks, because everybody's attention's on the national end of it while he comes into the church of Jesus Christ and creates chaos and division. You see, he put our focus on something else and didn't put our focus in the church. Oh, he's smart. Where did Jesus minister at? To the local communities, folks. To the individuals. Not on a national level. Now let me just precursor this. I don't care. I'd have brought this message whether it, the Republicans were in or the Democrats were in. I don't care. See, it's a meat and potatoes message to the church. To start planning the battle. To start acting like soldiers of the cross instead of acting like fearful people who shrivel up at the first signs of defeat. Have you shriveled up because of all this? Hope not. Because if you're fearful, you lost hope. You're not putting your fear and your hope in the right person. To understand we don't have a spirit of timidity, but the spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline, of a sound mind. That's what Paul told Timothy in his letter to Timothy. Hey, don't be timid, but stand up. Have that spirit of power, of that love, and that sound discipline. We are soldiers of the king who have been instructed to stand and fight. We have the weapons and the suit of armor, Ephesians 6. 
We have the word of God. And we have the suit of armor. That we go out and we stand firm in. Folks, this isn't a baby Christian message that Jude is writing. It's not a bottle feeding. It's a trumpet call to the church to train, to equip, to stand firm, to give praise to the one who is able. There's a battle going on within the church herself which is more important than a presidential election, folks. Can you swallow that? I hope so. There's an enemy that is within the walls of WBC, this church, as well as all the churches around the world. And Jude calls out the church to stand up to these enemies who are false teachers. Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into liciousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Contend for the faith. I can tell you this, and I'll challenge you to this. You read Paul's letters, you read John's letters. First, second, third to John, and even in the book of Revelation. Paul and John names these false teachers that we're going to talk about. I can sit up here and name probably 10 or 15, just on television, who are false teachers. Just give me a minute to explain that. We're going to explain it right here in a minute. We should be bold and confident in recognizing false teachers among us, folks. That's biblical. You see, this, this is biblical. It's in his word. Don't be repulsed by this. God's word is true and it happens to this church and all the other churches. Right? If we believe that's God's word, then we need to be aware of it, right? Right? This is the word of God. Those who witness and speak louder than their words. These witnesses that are false. And we're going to talk about their fruits. And their characteristics here in a minute. So I want to give you three truths this morning. About why we need to thank Jesus for being able. Why do we need to thank Jesus for being able? First of all. Thank you Jesus for being able to keep the true Christian from stumbling verse 24 look in verse 24 now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling the true Christian I said the true Christian there's many people who who say that they're Christians who aren't there's many Christ people who go out and they say hey yeah you know what I'm a Christian I'm a Christ follower their life shows no work of it we're going to talk about that there are Christians who call themselves Christians who truly know the Lord as their Savior, but who follow false teachings. We'll talk about that. It's not a mistake. I want you to notice in that verse, it says to keep. God will keep, right? He, he's able to keep you. That, that, that is a military term, and it means guard. God is able to guard his children. He's the one who is able to keep Christians from falling into false teachings. Jude says there in verse 4 that there would be enemies who would come in what? The church. They come in sheep's clothing is what Paul says in Acts 20, 28, and 29. He said, keep, he, he's talking to the elders of the church. Keep watch over yourselves first of all. And then all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he brought, bought. With his own blood. I know after my departure, savage wolves, false teachers, false prophets, will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves. Do you see? You need to read that. Go back and read it. From among your own selves will arise 
speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. You know what? In every church, every church, God's word says there's false teachers, there's savage wolves who want to draw the true Christian away, take off the focus. Don't get mad at me, folks. Okay? I'm just the messenger. False prophets have been talked about from the very beginning in Genesis all the way to the Revelation. In every church. They're here to kill, steal, and destroy the work of God. To replace what? Truth with error. Truth with error. But there's something. You know what? Here's what I go. This is what I told the first server. There's someone saying, who gives you the right to judge? Who gives you the right to judge, Chris? Who gives anybody the right to judge? Or who are you to judge? No one has a right to judge anyone. Go to Matthew 7 with me. Matthew 7, the first book of the gospel, chapter 7. We're going to go through this real quickly. Okay? We're going to go through this real quickly. No one has the right to judge anybody else. Judge not, lest you be judged. You ever heard that? Anybody ever said that to you? Well, I'm going to give you the answer to them. Okay? Now, Jesus in the first part, he says what? Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged by your standard of measure. It will be measured to you. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But let me just put it this way. Jesus says, before you look at people, before you look at their teachings, before anything else, you evaluate yourselves to see if you're in the faith. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, evaluate yourself to see if you're in the faith. So first of all, as Christians, as true Christians, we've got to sit down and we've got to evaluate our hearts to see if we're convicted of anything. And then if we're not, then what happens, okay? Okay. Jesus says to take the log out of your own eye. You're a hypocrite. Don't look for the speck. And then he goes in and says this. Do not give what is holy to the dogs and do not throw your pearls before the swines. They will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Judgment number one. Who are the swine and who are the dogs that you don't throw the holy things to God about? That's a judgment. Let me tell you something, folks. We judge throughout our whole life. You judge this morning what clothes you're going to wear. Where you're going to go. What type of car you want to drive. Whatever it is. There's judgments. Okay? So you've got to judge who's the dogs and who's the swine and who aren't. He goes in. He says, if you'll ask, then I'll give it to you. Seek and knock. He said, you know what? Treat others uh, the way that you want to be treated. So you do that, what? Winsomely respectfully standing firm in the love. Judgment number two, the narrow and the wide, wide gates. Enter through the narrow gate, for the narrow gate, uh, for, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and what the way is narrow that leads to life and there's few who find it. Judgment number two, is Jesus the only way, the truth and the life? Or is there other ways? Judgment number two. Judgment number three. Beware of the false prophets. Ooh. Beware to turn your mind, your attention to, to guard, to alert, to, to be wary about. How do you do that? How do you beware of false prophets? You have to judge by their fruits. How do we know that? Let's go on. You see, he said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, be inward, but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from the thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. He's saying, you know what? Grapes don't grow on thistle bushes. They grow on what? Grapevines. 
You know their fruit. Figs grow on fig trees, not thistles. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad fruit produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is the eternal fire of hell. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says, I'm a Christian. Not everyone who says, hey, I come to church. Hey, not everyone who says, hey, I, I, I've given money and, and my mom and dad's been in church and all this stuff. The final judgment. If they don't have faith alone in Jesus Christ, what's he going to say? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many, many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you accursed one who practiced lawlessness. You know what, folks? We have to judge what people's teaching because salvation in eternity is on the line. And there's false teachers out there that don't believe that Jesus is the only way. Or that only believes that Jesus was a moral man. Or that he was just an ordinary man. What are the fruits of a wolf in sheep's clothing? Or a false teacher in sheep's clothing? Jude 10 through 16 tells us. It tells us once again what those uh, fruits are in a in a crossway article that i read the other day i'm going to give you some fruit of false teachers of wolves in first Corinthians. first of all they create confusion and they want to twist the truth they want to create confusion and twist the truth. Look in verse 11 of Job. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for, have paid, uh, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of uh, Korah. You see, they want to twist the truth that fits them. They want to twist the truth of God's word from truth to error. They avoid taking responsibility. They deny reality. They make up stories. You know what? They deny reality. There's a lot of people that deny reality in the fact that Jesus is the only way. They're the ones that turn grace into lies. They say, hey, I'm saved so I can live my life the way you want it. You know what? I could come up here and preach it. Hey, you know what? You're saved. You don't have to worry about it. Just go and do what you want to do. And you're all right. That's false teaching. There are unreasoning, unreasoning animals. They revile things that they don't understand. They don't understand because they don't know what God's word is. Number two, they are experts at fooling others with smooth, smooth speeches and flattering words. Look in verse 16. These are grumblers, fault finders, Following after their own lust, they speak arrogantly and what? Flattering people for their sake of gaining an advantage. Isn't that interesting? They have no real evidence of any type of godly growth or change. It's all smoke screens and mirrors. You know, remember David Copperfield? Oh, the, he, he would be on television. He could make the Statue of Liberty disappear through what? Smoke screens and mirrors. That's the way these people are. Oh, they sound real good. They sound real pleasing. They sound like they really got it. But it's all a smokescreen. Jude calls them arrogant, flattering others for the sake of gain, advantage. They want their way, not God's way. Thirdly, they crave and demand control. Their highest authority is their own self. I don't want to answer to anybody, but I want to do it my way. I want to teach it this way. I'm going to lead others the way that I believe it. Why? Because I can get more support, I can get more power, I can have more success. Jude says they are fault finders. Anything that 
people want to do for God. They, no, nah, you don't need to do it that way. I can't believe you're going to do it that way. I can't believe you're a Bible-thumping Christian. I can't believe how arrogant you are. You understand? Because the truth is narrow. It's, it, it's not broad. It's narrow. All they care about is their own selves. Verse 12 in Jude, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, that love feast is the meal they had before they took communion. So they would come into that meal. They were without fear. All they cared about was themselves. And then he makes some analogy. Clouds without water carried along by the winds. Autumn trees without fruit. Do you see that again? There you go. Is your fruit. Doubly dead and uprooted. And then, of course, in verse 16 again, where they find fault. These reject any type of feedback. They always play the victim when confronted. They make up their own rules by taking Scripture out of context, then they ignore it. They reject passages of the required self-examination. We're required to have self-examination in our lives as Christians. As true Christians. We're required in that. They play on the sympathies of good-willed people. Verse 12 again. When they come in. They demand mercy but they never give it back. They demand love and forgiveness. Yet they don't demonstrate any of that to anyone. They don't try to re rebuild broken relationships. Fifth. They only have a conscience which benefits them. Look in verse 19. These are the ones who cause division, worldly minded and devoid of the Spirit. These are the ones who have not the Holy Spirit within their hearts and within their lives, the Spirit of truth who teaches the Word of God to you as His children, as a true Christian. And as you go into the Word of God and, and He shows you those central truths that apply to your life, these people don't have it. They're devoid of the Spirit. They've never trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yet all they want to do is what? Have it their way. No remorse. They don't struggle with sin. They delight in dividing. Especially the church. Wanting their own way. Talk to people about their own agenda. Not God's will. Do it in secret. And tell people to keep it to themselves all the time. They don't demonstrate any confidentiality. They're going from person to person. Hey keep this a secret but. The fruits of the wolves in the church. They're non-believers. Verse 5. Now I desire to remind you though. You know all things for once and for all. After saving a people out of the land of Egypt. Subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. They reject authority. Verse 8. Yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority. The first authority that they reject is Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The second thing they reject is God's word, the Bible. The third thing they reject is the leadership in the church. Because they want it their way. They're devoid of the Spirit, Jude says. Self-serving, centered, indulging, driven by their own lust, not sacrificial, 16 and 19. These false teachers come into the church full of opinions and half-truths. You see, there's an attack upon the church, folks. Don't matter what's happening nationally. If there's an attack on the church of Jesus Christ that we need to be aware of. They come in sounding so good, but they're not biblical. So when people say, who are you to judge? This is what I always say to them. I can judge because Jesus judged. And Jesus is going to judge your heart. You're going to stand in front of him. You're going to give an account to him. He's going to know whether you're a true Christian or not. Okay? When people say, who are you to judge? I say, Jesus could judge, and he told me that I could judge the fruits. 
and to beware of the false teachings. So yes, I am allowed to judge. The people who say, who are you to judge? Why do they do that? Because they know in their own heart that there's sin and there's moral sin in their heart and they try to deflect it back on you, trying to compare with you, and they don't want to admit it. Instead of admitting it. You know what? True Christians, they may take offense to that, but when they sit down and they pray about it and God convicts them of that, they'll come back to you and say, thank you for making me stronger, for growing me in Christ because you're right. That's the difference. So yes, we're allowed to judge. We as Christians, those who have been called, Jude says, who have a true relationship with the Lord are reminded who it is who has the authority over the false teachers, who has the authority over evil, who has the authority over all things because of the salvation he provided to us. He saved the people out of the land of Egypt. He has saved us if you have trusted in his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. He has saved you from that eternal damnation. If you've truly trusted him and surrendered your life to him. The Lord will guard us from stumbling. You know what? Even if a Christian stumbles, even if we sin, we stumble, but guess who's right there ready to keep us from falling? Jesus Christ is. Isn't that sweet? That's sweet to me. I don't know about you. That's sweet that I know that he's right there beside me keeping me from stumbling. Or falling into the dreams and the grips of these false teachers which may be whispering into the ears of the church. How? Because the Lord is able. What does that word able mean in verse 24? It means to be or become sufficient to meet a need or a task. To give power to. To be strong. To prevail against or defeat. Who will deliver us from false teachers and apostates? Jesus is able if we let him. But he's still even able if we don't. How do we know that? Verse 17. says, But you, beloved, ought to rem remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles. Remembering his word, folks. We have the true, inerrant word of God in front of us. Psalm 73, 1 says this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are what? Pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. Why did they come close to stumbling? My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Think about it. It's what Jude is saying about these false teachers. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's God who is able. Psalm ninety four eighteen. If I should say my foot has slipped, your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. Truth comes from God's word. It's through reminding us of sin. Verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly. You know what? We were ungodly at one time. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were walking in darkness at one time. And we need to remember that because the old man is still there. And the old man can arise. And the old man can cause us to sin. Why is that? Well, Jeremiah 23, 14 says this. Also among you, the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. Jeremiah is talking about the false teachers. They're committing adultery and walking in falsehood. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoer so that no one has turned back his witness. Titus 1. 10 and 11 says for there are many rebellious men empty talkers deceivers especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families teaching things they should not be able to teach for the sake of sordid gain there's passage after passage after passage about standing up to these false teachers 
Revelation 2.2 says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. Can we judge false prophets? Can we judge false? Yes. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen glory, the short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. The true Christian understands that they're declared righteous in the blood of Jesus Christ. We aren't righteous. We're declared righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Genesis 8.21 says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on the account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never destroy every living thing as I've done. Romans 7.19.20 says, For the good that I want, I do not, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me, the Apostle Paul. People's pe people always loving the Apostle Paul, putting him up on the pulpit. And he say, hey, you know what? I struggle with that old man all the time, and I struggle with sin all the time. That's why we have to evaluate ourselves in the faith. We have to understand where we're at ourselves before we go. To the false teachers. As true believers, we can be swayed by these wolves. As true believers, if, if we're not in the Word and we're not evaluating it and we're not looking at it and we're not studying it, we can be swayed by those smooth talking, flattering people who look so good to follow. We got to recognize their ways, ask for forgiveness, 1 John 1 9. Otherwise, God's discipline will be upon us if we continue to follow in the ways of the world of the false teachers. Let me ask you this, this question. If you are a true Christian and you are in sin, you will be miserable until you confess that sin to Jesus Christ. If you are a true Christian and you know you are in sin and he has convicted you of sin, you will be miserable. How do I know that? Because the God in which saved you from the eternal damnation is the same God who loves you. That's judgment and love, okay? And his word says in Hebrews 2, 5 through 11, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son and daughter whom he receives. It is for the discipline that you endure. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best. He was talking about the earthly fathers. But his discipline, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. You know what? This is what I'm trying to get at, church, is that we need to be disciplined and we need to share into his holiness and we need to stand up to false teachers. We need to stand up to those who go against God's word. Why? Because the church is holy. And we're blameless, and we're going to see that right here in a minute. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields to a what? The peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's that fruit. So you know what? If you're in sin today, if you're living not for Jesus Christ... But you say that you're a Christian and you're miserable and everything is going against you and you can't figure out what's going on in your life. Maybe God's disciplining you to show you he loves you and he wants you to come back. Don't listen to the culture. Don't listen to these false teachers who said you can go out and live your, your life like hell and it's all right because Jesus loves you. Thank you, Jesus, for being able to cause true believers not to stumble. Thank you, Jesus, for being able to make us stand blameless. Look in verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. It's because Jesus was able to do something we cannot do ourselves. He is able to save us. You can't save yourself. 
I can't save myself. Jesus came as a man and he was God. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. False teachers will tell you he's a good moral teacher. He was just a man. He wasn't God in the flesh. Don't believe him. He lived a perfect life, sinless. Even the, main, the people that hated him, the false teachers that, that were against him, could not convict him of one sin. It's in the Bible. It's evidence. And he fulfilled God's law for us. We couldn't fulfill it for ourselves. It was through the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary, the one in which you and I should have been on. We should have been on that cross. Not him. But he loved us so much that he died and he shed his blood and he died and he was buried and he was resurrected. And there's victory in that resurrection. When we truly trust in him, we'll be blameless, folks. Not down here, but when we stand in front of him. How do I know that? Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. That's God, and then that's the Lord Jesus. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments that, and, and standing before the angel of the Lord. That's the sin. That's that filthy garment, polluted garment. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said, see I have taken your inequity away from you and will clothe you with festival robes. It's the white robes that we read about in Revelation. Then I say, let me... Put a clean turban on your head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with these garments. And while the angel of the Lord, while, while Jesus was standing there, buying. And the angel of the Lord adamished Joshua saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my court. And I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. Now listen, Joshua, the high priest. You and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are symbols. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant the branch. When we believe in Jesus Christ, he declares us righteous. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to stand blameless. And I take great joy in that, folks. I hope you do. I'm not happy. You know what? There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is a fleeting moment. Joy is eternity. And you know what? I know that when I stand before my Savior Jesus Christ, I can stand and look at him and say, I've done everything that I know what to do for you. And then he can judge me and give me the rewards that he wants to or he don't have to give me any rewards. I'll just bask in his glory. Jesus is able to make a stand blameless with great joy through the cross fixing our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of faith who the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of god thank you jesus for being able to make me blameless and to make you blameless hebrews 12 to thirdly to love and give us hope Thank you, Jesus, for being able to love and give us hope. Verses 17 and verses 25. To the only God of our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all time, now, and forever. Let's look at that love. Love is more than emotion. I want you to hear that. The, the culture in which you live in, the culture in which you're attacked by every Love is more than emotion. Love is more than enabling someone to make them feel accepted. Love is a commitment. It is a commitment to those in whom we commit to. In the bad times, in the good times, in the in-between times, love stays when things get raw, tough, and rough. You going to stay, church? You know why things going to get raw, tough, and rough here in these next how many ever years? Are you going to stay? Are you going to stay committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to run away?
A Christian's first love is standing with Christ, not against him. Let me say it again. A Christian's first love is standing with Christ and not against him. A Christian's first love is standing in the word of Christ, not against it. Love is a commitment to the one who we are married to. We are married to Christ when we come to him. Love is understanding the cost of that marriage first as an individual Christian and then to the church. We love because he first loved us. There's no fear in love. Are you fearful today? Let me give you some hope and encouragement. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. When you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have nothing to fear. Love involves grace and truth, folks. John 1.17, you'll see it. John says, hey, Moses gave us the law, but Jesus gave us grace. Is that all it says? No, it says grace and truth. Many people want to run with that word grace, but they forget to put the truth on it. To have the grace, you have to understand the truth that Jesus calls you to surrender to him and to live your life for him Not just to go out and put that gravy of grace like I call it on. It's grace and truth. It's discipline and assurance. Hope. In the past few months, the loss of hope has had a deadly effect on Christians and non-Christians alike. When people lose hope, they lose courage. When they lose courage, they lose a reason to live. The darkest moment, folks, is before the dawn. It's where you are today. Because I have great news today. If you're right there in that darkest moment, dawn is going to come. And there's hope in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in our Savior. He's the mediator between God and man. He's the one who bridges the gap. He's the one who overcomes death through the resurrection. He displays his power over all things. I'm going to ask you this morning two questions. Christians, do you need to come and repent? Do you need to come and change your mind in saying, you know what, I don't put my faith in government. I don't put my faith in spouse. I don't put my faith in family. But I put my faith in the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who's sitting on his throne right now. Who has everything under control. Do you need to come and repent about not doing that? Asking forgiveness because you don't trust him. Asking him to strengthen you and give you the peace only he can give. Nothing is lost, folks, because he is able. Did you see that? He is able to keep you. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Nothing. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. You're not a true Christian. You haven't surrendered your life to him. Oh, you come to church or you give some money or you talk a big game. But really and truly you're leading other people in false teachings. Maybe you need to come and you need to trust him. Folks, he's the eternal God, and he's the true teacher of the teachings. He deserves the glory. He deserves the majesty. He de he's over all dominions. He has all authority, Matthew 28. I have all authority in heaven. Is that what he said? For you all that know it, I have all authority in heaven. Mm -mm, that's not what he said. He said, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? He's the eternal God who was before all times, is now, and will always be. He's able to keep the true Christian from stumbling. He's able to make the true Christian blameless. With great joy, he's able to love the true Christian and give them hope through the darkest times. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more 
than we can ask or imagine according to His power that is in work with us. What a promise, folks. What a promise. Thomas Dorsey wrote a song. I think it's appropriate in the times that we're in. I think it's appropriate. It says, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows uh, dreary, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my cry. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. I serve a God that's able, folks. I serve a God in whom I know has my best interest at heart, who I know that no matter what happens, no matter if there's oppression, there's persecution, they cut my head off, they cut my arms off, they do whatever, that you know what? He'll have my hand and he'll lead me home. Don't care. He's my Lord and Savior. Is he yours this morning? Truly. As Andrew and as Debbie come and Phil, oh, as Phil comes, and Debbie, sorry, comes we're going to sing our hymn of invitation I'm going to ask you I'm going to ask you what do you need to do you need to come to the altar you need to come and talk to me you need to pray where you're at today can be a transforming life event if you'll allow the Lord who's able to do it in understanding that there's hope tomorrow there's hope a week from now there's hope a month from now there's a hope four years from now there's a hope ten years from now if you allow it. Phil?
I'm just going to ask Debbie if she'd play through one more verse. I just want you to bow your heads, folks. Don't, don't pass this moment up. The Holy Spirit's working, whether you know it or not. He's working in your life. You know, the song is wonderful. It's an old vacation Bible school song. I've decided to follow Jesus. You know what? That takes a commitment to do that. When you commit to Him, then you can stand up to these false teachings of this world, of whoever it may be. Just allow Him to speak to your heart. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who works, who convicts, who encourages, who gives courage and boldness. We thank you, Lord, for your word that shows us who to stay away from. We thank you, Lord, that we can be able to judge according to your word. That we have the power to correct and rebuke. That there's nothing wrong with that in love. I thank you, Lord, that you're on your throne. That you know exactly what you're doing in times like today. So, Father, I pray that as we walk out of this place today, that, Lord, we wouldn't fear, but that we would trust. That we wouldn't be backed in the corner, but that we would have the courage to stand firm and bold. That we would be the salt and the light that you have called us to be as your children, as soldiers of the cross. We hear the trumpet sound the call to come and stand to show a dark and dying world what love is really all about so father i thank you for the way that you've worked here i pray lord that we would continue to chew upon it this week and as we do lord may you show us the truth set us free thank you lord thank you for kindle thank you for her baptism. Thank you for her heart. Thank you, Lord, for that little girl that shared Jesus with her. <laughs> Four year, fourth grade. <laughs> and there's even people that won't even share Jesus in their 70s and their 80s. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for her heart. And I thank you for Kendall's heart and her smile that lights up everybody that she comes in. I pray, Lord, this over her today I pray Lord that you would use this ordinary little girl to do extraordinary things as she grows up to be a witness to others thank you Lord for this time together for being able to worship you to praise you for the things in which you can do thank you because you're able for it's in your son's name we pray Amen <laughs>